How many of you in the house are parents? Say amen. amen. How many of you love the kids your parents? Say amen. amen. How many of you there were days? Amen. <laughs> uh, man, the act of parenting, I was thinking about this as I was preparing the sermon today, is that no one's ready for it. No matter how much you tried, no matter how much you thought you were ready for it, how many of you would say amen to that, that the moment it happened, you were not ready? And then they give you a ton of stuff. Like I, Jennifer, when she was pregnant with our first, Vanessa, and she's 23 now, uh, when, when Jennifer was pregnant, I went and got What to Expect When You're Expecting. And I read that book because I wanted to know because I was going to kill this dad thing. Little did I know, most of that book is all written from the mom's perspective and breastfeeding and all the aftercare stuff. I didn't have really any, I was like, this is frightening me. And... Uh, so then I got, this, just a few weeks ago, I was in Walmart, and I walked by the book section in Walmart, because I'm a reader, and so I swung by there and looked, and there's a new edition of what to expect when you're expecting. And I was terrified, because I thought, how much more information can there be? Because the first one was this thick, and I think there are several editions since then. And how many of you know this? No matter how much you learn, you're going to run into somebody that goes... <laughs> That's not how I would do it. <laughs> or even better, this is how you should do it. Those are my favorites. And, and we live in it as parents. We, are you going to spank your children? Are you going to put them in a corner? Are you going to put them in time out? Are you going to do what? Are you going to breastfeed? Is it going to be formula? Does it really even matter? I, man, there's a million questions out there that there's no right or wrong answer to. Because here's the reality. I, I can tell you that some of my kids really needed spankings. A lot. Then I can also tell you some of my kids, talking to does the same thing. Because they're different. How many of you know your kids are different? And it's a blessing that they're different. Because man, how boring would that be if they were all the same. And so I want to just kind of walk through a couple things today. What I'm going to tell you today is not going to blow your mind. I pray it challenges you. That's my prayer. I pray that you leave today challenged as a parent, a grandparent. Also, we're living, we're living in a day and age culturally where grandparents are raising more grandkids than at any other point in history. Any other point in history, grandparents are raising grandkids. And so, pa grandparents, you're having to walk through not only a little bit of a gap from when you were practicing, practicing these things before to the fact that, let's just be honest, you're a little more tired now than you used to be. Am I right? Look, I'm, I'm 46 in March, and we have a five-year-old. And when Vanessa, my oldest, was five, I was only 28 years old. There's a difference between 46-year-old with a five-year-old and 28-year-old with a five-year-old. I don't argue with the five-year-old anymore. I'm just like, whatever. I don't, I don't care. I don't care. I love you, but... You can eat cereal or ramen or cereal with ramen. I don't care. <laughs> Anybody with me on that? Like, <laughs> no, wait, wait. I didn't say it was a good thing. Like, <laughs> and so there, there's seasons to walk through, and, and parenting be, is becoming, because here's what we, what we do know, is that there is more information available right now than at any other point. Not that the information wasn't around, but it's available if I ask you to pull out your phone and Google parenting tips, do you know how many pages upon pages upon pages of parenting tips you get? It would be incredible. And most of them would contradict each other. Because everybody has an idea. So what I want to do is I want to kind of just dial it way back and talk to you from a perspective of what the Bible says. Now, whether you're a parent, grandparent, not a parent, today will be challenging for you. Because I, I need you to hear the challenge that God has for you in the text today. So if you have your Bible, we're going to be in 1 Samuel chapter 1 and chapter 3. You can turn there. It'll be on the screen, but I challenge you, if you have your Bible, go ahead and turn there with me. Uh, before, while you're turning there, just a couple announcements. Uh, parenting classes are going to be starting back up at the Reach Center. I know that was good timing, wasn't it? <laughs> Preaching on parenting, offering classes. In case any of you leave today wanting to commit homicide with your kids. Um, <laughs> We have a daytime class available and an evening class available. If you'd like more information, you can swing by the Connect counter. 
Also, one of the things that Aaron said in the announcement is very true, and I need you to hear me on this. If you guys will look around our 10 o'clock service, which in the Bible Belt is considered the bread and butter service. That's the best time for everybody, not because it's the best time, because that's what we all grew up with going to church. It's 10 o'clock, so everybody slides into 10 o'clock. If you'll look around, we'll see this service is starting to get a little tight, which is a great thing, and, and honestly, in the last two years, I wasn't sure any services were ever going to get tight again because of what we walked through. But we will, I will say this. There is some space in the 830. There is some space in the 1130. If you're pl planning on, if you have people right now that you're inviting, the only reason I tell you this is because we've walked through it before. We've had people pull in the parking lot, couldn't find a parking spot, and left and didn't come back to church because they couldn't find a place to park. We've also had people come in, walk in the back door, and turn around and walk back out because it was too overwhelming for them to find a seat. And so if it at all possible, if, you, if you're planning on inviting somebody, you want them to come to church, try to catch that 830, try to catch the 1130 service. Now, if it comes down to I'm not going at all if I have to go to those other two services, then you come right on back here to the 10 o'clock. We'll keep putting chairs out or we'll put them up here and you can help me. All right? <laughs> uh, I, I'm, I'm thinking about some of you specifically to come and help me. So <laughs> it's going to be a lot of fun when we get there. But, all right, let's dive into this. So here's where we're at with parenting. Again, there's so many different opinions out there. People go, well, Pastor Vince, if you would do a podcast, we'd love you to do it on parenting. I'm like, why, why would you want me to do a podcast? They said, you have, adults, you have adult children that are married. You have adult children with kids. You have teenage kids. And you have a five-year-old. And I'm like, yeah, what that means is I'm exhausted. I have nothing. I don't want to talk about it anymore. <laughs> But it also means that I've walked through some stuff like a lot of you have. I'm in no means a professional at this, just like most of us aren't. But I serve the God who's perfect. And the perfect God that I serve has promised that he will give you wisdom and discernment and knowledge if you ask. All right? And so God has done that. He's blessed our family. My kids are not perfect. They're really close, but they're not perfect. All right? Any of you have perfect kids? Say amen. Anybody have perfect grandkids? Yeah, <laughs> I'm learning this one. That's right. So, so we know they're not. I, I, I know that as a parent, again, you're going to get opinions from everybody. I can remember one of the first times that Jennifer and I went shopping. And it was our entire crew at the time. There was five of us, five kids and me and Jennifer. If you've if you got five kids and they're all under eight, that's where we were at. We had five, six, no, it was nine Nine, seven, five, two, and newborn. And so we were in two carts. This lady comes up, walks up to us and goes, are those all your kids? <laughs> and of course, when God gives you the gift to speak. <laughs> Just so you know, how many of you know gifts work both ways? They can both be a blessing and a curse. And so I said, Yes, ma'am, these are all our kids. <sighs> and then she said my favorite statement that everybody says, especially if you have a larger family. I know Austin and Leah, you guys have caught this one. Don't you know what causes that? <laughs> and, and God gave me a word. <laughs> and I said, Yes, ma'am, and it's far too fun to stop doing. Wow. She just rolled on. <laughs> it was, it was hot. So people, people are going to end, you know, now people are going to step in your world. Parents, here's the fun thing. You're going to have parents step in your world. Your parents are going to step in your parenting world. All the grandparents were like, wait a minute, we're supposed to do that. <laughs> eh. We'll get there, all right? The Bible teaches us a couple things that we're supposed to do. And again, today I want to just challenge you, all right? I'm going to challenge you to do three things today. But we're going to dive into the scripture first. Let me give you some backstory in 1 Samuel. We have 1 Samuel who's coming on the scene. In chapter 1, he's not born yet. Samuel isn't. But there's a priest in the temple whose name is Eli. And there's a family in the community of Israel there, in the country of Israel. And the family is Elkanah. He has a wife, Penina. And he has another wife, Hannah. Hannah 
before, just in case you didn't know, that was a biblical culture. It's not as much acceptable today. Okay? Don't get two. <laughs> Fellas. Just don't do it. All right? So they're, they're, here they are in this situation. Hannah could not have kids, so she was barren, which in a biblical culture would have been seen as something a slight almost, like, Ugh, sorry for you, Hannah. And it would have been, she would have been looked down upon as one who could not have children, could not bear children. And, and Penina, the, the other wife, didn't mind letting her know about it, that she couldn't have kids. And so we have this, this kind of conflict in the home going on. But being a Jewish family, every year they would go to the temple to offer sacrifice. And every year they would go to the temple, and Penina would be able to go in with Elkanah, and they would be able to go in and, and be able to offer sacrifice. And, and Hannah kind of sat on the out, outside again as, as the barren wife, the, the one who couldn't, couldn't do. And this, again, culturally, I need you to understand, she couldn't do what she was created to do. And so she was seen as less than. But one time at the temple, Hannah begins to weep in prayer. And she begins to weep. Deep, deep sobs. And the Bible paints this picture of her weeping and moving her mouth but not speaking the words. She's just praying in her heart. And, and the priest sees her. And he said, woman, you need to get off the wine, is what he said to her. And he, she said, sir, I have had no strong drink or wine. My heart is broken. My heart is broken. I, I desire a child. She didn't even tell him. She just said, I have brought my petition before the Lord. And so the priest said, that which you have prayed, see to it that the Lord will answer your prayer. And so she gets this answer from the Lord. And so we see this in, in verse 11. This is what happens. And she vowed a vow and said, Lord of hosts, if you will indeed, this is where she goes back to God on her petition. If you will indeed look on the affliction of your servant and remember me and not forget your servant, but will give to your servant a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life, and no razor shall touch his head. You say, what does it have to do with his haircut? When in the Old Testament, you see this in a couple people, and it's just a Bible story lesson for you here. Uh, Samson was what was called a Nazarite, okay? Samuel would have been considered a Nazarite. This not cutting the hair vow went along with a Nazarite vow, which was a separation. And I know I've heard this. People go, oh, yeah, Jesus was a Nazarite. That's why he had that long, beautiful hair. Nope, he was not a Nazarite. Jesus was a Nazarene. There's a difference. A Nazarene told you where you were from. Jesus was from Nazareth. He was a Nazarene. A Nazarite was a vow that was taken before the birth of a child and then that child dedicated into that vow, okay? So this is what Hannah is saying. Lord, if you'll give me a child, I'll give him back. If you'll give me a child, I'll give him back. And so she prayed that to God. She went to God and she prayed and she said, Lord, here's my situation. I want a child desperately. I want to know what it feels like to be a mom. I want to know what it feels like to love something like that. And if you'll, if you'll just hear my prayer and not forget me and not set aside my affliction, not set aside my loneliness, but you'll hear me, then I will give them back to you. So here's the first thing I want you to do. Parents, grandparents, anybody that's near children, pray for them. Pray for those kids. Say what fits. That's the most basic point you've ever had in a sermon. Here's the thing. Stop praying for yourself and pray for them. Because sometimes we pray this, Lord, give me the strength to handle them. Right? Sometimes, and it's not bad to pray for yourself. What I want you to do is change your mentality from a shotgun to a rifle in praying for your kids. Pray specific things for your children. I've prayed that my kids would have success in what they do. I've prayed that they would love the jobs that they get to grow up just like I do. I love that I get to do this. This is my job. This is my vocation. Not only is it my call, but it is my vocation. And I get to spend my entire week sharing Jesus Christ with people from all over the place. And what an honor it is for me to do that. But if I just sit and say, Lord, bless them. Lord, help them today. Help them with what today? God, they got a test in algebra. And I need, I need your, they need your help. Some of you, and, and Lord, they're dealing with a boyfriend-girlfriend situation, and it doesn't make any sense to me at all. 
But Lord, they need you right now. And you pray specific things into their life, for their life, specifically for them. If I were to ask you right now, what specifically are you praying for your children? Could you give me a list? Or would it be one or two things? Parents, this is our job. This is our role. This is our honor that God has bestowed with us. Just like the arrows in the hands of a warrior, I promise you an arrow that has a quiver full of arrows or a warrior that has a quiver full of arrows, make sure the point is sharpened. He's not walking out the next day without a sharp point on the arrow. That's not what warriors do. They make sure their stuff is ready, down to the detail. I wonder in your kid's life, are they experiencing pointed prayer from you in regards to their life? She said, Lord, if you'll bless me with a son, I will give this son back to you. There's very specific language in here. And so we see this happen. So you say, Pastor Vince, what do I do next? If I pray for him, and I'm good at praying for him, whether it's my son, my daughter, my grandkids, the neighbor's kids that hang out. We had a little boy when we moved into our house. We were there two days. Two days. Kid runs through the back door. Never seen him before in my life. You get, you know, remember? He runs into the back door, stops in our, in, in our den, and he was like, my name's Lucas! Shoom, shot right up the stairs. Didn't know him from nothing. Love that little dude now. I don't get to see him as often. They moved, but man, he'd come around and ride his little scooter down to the house or whatever, but he just shot in there, man, like, hey, I'm here. Good luck. <laughs> That's kind of how it was with him. But I wonder, in your life, are you praying specifically for a need, for for a desire? God, I pray that when they find their spouse, whoever it may be, that they be happy and joyful and loving to one another. God, I pray that their job, that their their school, whatever it is, Lord, their anxiety, their struggles, their stress, their insecurities, that most likely came from me. Be brought before you. Are you praying specific things for your kids? Well, I don't need to pray for them, Pastor Vince. I just straighten them out if they do stuff wrong. Godspeed in your journey, if that's your attitude. Because it is a failed one. It is a flawed one. My kids are getting older, and so now the conversation changes. Now we talk about money and investing and rent and bills and stuff. Last night, we got to play. My son, Caleb, got an Oculus for Christmas. I don't know if you know what this is, but it's virtual reality. There's a game on there called Gorilla Tag. Is that what it's called? I'm having to look at my kids for confirmation on this. I have not done it yet because if I put on a virtual reality helmet, I'm going to puke in my floor. I know myself. <laughs> and I don't want to clean it up because that's what's going to happen. So, um, but, so he gets in there. And the thing is, this game, you don't use your legs. You don't run. I'm like, that's not reality. He's like, it's virtual reality. I'm like, okay. But literally, it cracks me up because I'll look in there and he's just doing this. There's a video of it. And he's moving his arms everywhere, but his body just spins in a circle. Listen, that's been the greatest gift for me, just to watch them do that. And I even like it when I can't hear any sound, just because I get to make up sounds in my head to what he's doing. <laughs> so, you know what? It's important for me to learn that stuff, to enjoy that stuff. I, I don't get it. I think I've played maybe two video games my entire life. King Griffey Baseball and the original Mario Brothers. That's it. Tech Mobile, yeah, I guess I could add a third. Um, But it's still important for me to get to know that because if I'm going to pray for them, I have to know them if I'm going to pray with a rifle and not a shotgun. I have to know them. Lord, I just hope their school stuff works out. What school stuff? Which teacher are they struggling with? Which course are they struggling with? Do they just need you to go, hey, you're killing it, man. You're going to do okay. You're going to make it. Or do they need you to sit down at the table with them at night and do homework until they get it done because they're just not, it's not in them yet? 
What do they need from you? You won't know unless you get to know them. So pray for your kids. Second thing is this. Not only pray for your kids, but I want you to follow through with the action. This is what happens in verse 24 as we come further down in chapter 1. And when she had weaned the child, this is Samuel who's now been born. God blessed her with a child. And so when he has been weaned, she took him up with her and a three-year-old bull and an epa of flour and a skin of wine. And she brought him to the house of the Lord at Shiloh. And the child was young. And then they slaughtered the bull and brought the child to Eli. And she said, oh, my Lord, as you live, my Lord, I am the woman who was standing here in your presence praying to the Lord. For this child I prayed. And the Lord has granted me the petition that I made unto him. Therefore, Because the Lord did what he said, I will be faithful. That's the premise of the passage. Because the Lord did what he said, I will be faithful. Therefore, I have lent him to the Lord. As long as he lives, he has lent unto the Lord. you got to follow through with your prayer. Don't expect God to miraculously give them the idea of algebra if you're not willing to sit down and open a book with them. Don't expect God to miraculously give them fantastic budgeting ideas if you don't sit down with a calculator with them. It's it's follow through. It's follow through. Because of what God's given us, we go to work. And please don't, don't understand the theology of that. I'm not saying we go to work so that God will bless us. No, God has already blessed us, and therefore we we give back. That's how that works. And so with your kids, are you pouring back into them what you've prayed? God, I want them to have this. And what part do I need to play in getting them there? What part do I need to play in getting them there? You say, okay, Pastor Vince, if I'm supposed to pray for them, then what's the, how, here's what I would say. You need to pray for guidance in their life, and then you need to teach them how to find it. You don't need to put it right in their lap. You don't need to constantly be telling them what to do. And this is after a certain age, okay? Look, sorry, youngins, if you're here and you're still living in a house and you don't have at least two digits in your age, you don't get a choice. It's just reality. You shouldn't be making choices. You don't know how to choose between peanut butter and jelly or ramen noodles. So here's the thing. There comes a place where you do have to start letting them have a choice. I said this in the last service. I said, the toughest part as a parent is where I'm at right now. Because see, early on, I get to drive. I get to sit in the driver's seat, hands on the wheel, hands on the pedals. I get to control the radio. It's awesome. I get to drive. As they get a little older, a transition happens, and I move from the driver's seat over to the passenger seat. And as I move into that passenger seat, I realize that there's really no brake on that side. I just get to grunt and squeal. As they're learning. Parents, you know what I'm talking about? How many of you remember those teenage years where you're like, oh, dear Jesus, what are they going to do today? Okay? And that's all right. Everybody has them. It's real. But you're not out of the car yet. You're still there. You may be yelling in their ear or cheering them on, but you're in the car. I'm in the season with some of my kids, about half of them right now. I'm not in the car anymore. The extent of my responsibility to them is a guardrail. And that's it. Now, they still call me for counsel, but usually it's just before they're about to run off the road and they go, boom, and bounce off. And I go, not a good idea. I don't know if I'd do that. I need to pray about that a lot. And they bounce off. And I don't get to make the call for them. God is teaching me that now my conversations with my older kids is they're just enjoyable. They're just as enjoyable. They're just about life now. It's not about me telling them everything to do. So I have to be able to pray for my child for direction in their life, but I have to do everything I can to teach them to find it on their own. Because there'll come a day I'm not here. See, I was raised by a praying mom. I can remember because I was that kid. I, I snuck out a time or two in my teenage years, and we had a big single pane glass window that had a slider on it and I would slide in through that front window and land on the couch so it didn't make noise and I would take my shoes off on the couch so my my shoes wouldn't make sound on the floor and I would walk back to my bedroom thinking I was creeping 
And I would look into my mom and dad's bedroom to make sure they were asleep. And down on her knees next to her bed with her elbows on the side of the bed, I'd hear my mama praying. God, whatever Vince is going through right now, I just pray you'd help him. Whatever decisions he's making, I pray you'd protect him. God, help me to be the mom that he needs. Help him to look to you for his answers. Here I was doing what I was doing, and she was growing comfortable being the guardrail. And it's hard, parents. It's hard. But it's a reality. So you've got to teach them to find it. And I'm so glad my mom prayed for me because watching her pray for me taught me how to find the way in my own life. Taught me that it's important to be at church. I grew up in a house like this, and this is going to make some of you mad. That's okay. You can be mad at me. I still love you. We don't get a choice about church. You don't get a choice. If you live in our house and it's Sunday, you go to church. Parker, did I ask you this morning if you wanted to go to church? No. And Parker's 15, and in 15 years, I haven't ever asked him if he wanted to go to church. Oh, but Vince, I feel like it's just too much pressure. You pressure him to play sports. You pressure him to eat when you want him to eat. Pressured them to walk when they were toddlers, right? Nobody was like, oh, look, they're crawling. I know they're seven. (laughs) They'll get there one of these days. We just don't want to put any pressure on them. You're like, Vince, that's ridiculous. I know in the most critical piece in their life that they will ever have, that they will ever have, have is the influence of Jesus Christ. And that's the one where we go, I just don't want to force it on them. If it's forced, parents, you're not living it right. Because I'm going to tell you, you don't have to force anything that you enjoy. That's not how it works. I don't have to force it. Some of my kids just told me straight out, they're like, you know, we went to church just because it was what we were supposed to do. Some days we didn't get anything. Some weeks I can't even remember what you preach, Dad. I'm like, I grew up with a preacher too. You think I remember everything my dad said? I don't. But I remember being there. And I remember it being an important part of our family. And what it helped me do was it taught me to find the right way. I always knew where to go back to. When I started doing my own thing, when I started running my own, making my own decisions and not all of them were good, that knowledge that had been put in me gave me something to always come back to. I always knew I could come back to the church. I always knew I could come back to Christ. I always knew that because it was put in me. So how do you get there, Pastor Vince? If I'm supposed to lead him, how do you get there? I'm going to read you the next part of the story. It's found in the third chapter, and I'm going to close after this. 1 Samuel chapter 3. Here's what we have now. In the middle chapter, we see Hannah's prayer about her child, but then we see that Eli had a couple boys named Hophni and Phinehas, and these kids were nuts. They were crazy. Making poor decisions in the temple. They'd grown, got a reputation for making poor decisions in the temple, and God told Eli, he said, Eli, for this cause, you'll have no old men in your family. Because of the way they're acting in the church, because of the way they're acting, because of the way they're treating me, the disrespect that they're showing for the kingdom, for me, there'll be no old men in your family. But Eli's getting up in years now, and Samuel has been there at the temple, growing up in the temple. Each year, his mom would bring him a new robe so that she would get to see him and see how he was doing. And, but Eli is now working, or Samuel's now working in the temple. Here's what it says. Now the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord in the presence of Eli. Now listen, this is just going to be extra right here. Do you notice what it says? The boy Samuel was doing what, church? Ministering. Who was he ministering to? The Lord. So you remember a few weeks ago when I told you we come to church to pour out our bucket and not get our bucket full? Here's the theology for that. God filled your bucket all week long with blessings and blessings and blessings and blessings. And Sunday is when we come to pour it out in praise and worship and serving God. 
That's what we do. That's what's happening here. It doesn't say that the Lord was ministering to Samuel in the temple. It said that Samuel was ministering to the Lord in the temple. He said, I'm pouring it all out back to you, God. That's what's happening in the presence of the Lord. And the word of the Lord was rare in those days. It wasn't a lot of vision. And at that time, Eli, whose eyesight had begun to grow dim so that he could not see, he was lying down in his own place. Well, the lamp of God had not yet gone out yet, so this was a time of day. So we're, we're dealing in, in the late evening, not quite early morning hours yet. The lamp had not quite gone out. And Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was. And then the Lord called Samuel. And Samuel said, here am I. And he ran to Eli and said, here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call, my son. Go lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord. Did you catch that? He's ministering to the Lord. He's serving in the church. He's at church every Sunday, every, every day Samuel's at the church. But he did not yet know the Lord. Parents, just because your kids walk through these doors don't mean they know Jesus ask them the question. Have that conversation with them. Do you know Jesus Christ as your Savior? Okay. Samuel did not yet know the Lord. He said again, Samuel, uh, verse 8, and the Lord called to Samuel again the third time and said, and he arose and he went to Eli and he said, for here I am, you called me. And Eli perceived finally that the Lord was calling the boy and he said, listen, Listen, this is what I need you to do, Samuel. If the Lord calls again, you shall say, Speak, Lord, for your servant hears. And so Samuel went down and laid in his place. And the Lord came and stood and calling as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, Speak, for your servant hears. Then the Lord said to Samuel, Behold, I'm about to do a new thing. I'm about to do a thing in which when all the people of Israel hear it, it will make their ears tingle. It's going to be so good. You know what caught me about this? Because how, how many of you are familiar with that story, Samuel hearing from God? Some of you grew up in church with it. You're familiar with it. I've, I, I've been called to preach. I've heard this story from the time I can remember my dad preaching. Here I am, Lord. Here's your servant. Lord, your servant servant hears. I, Lord, here I am. Lord's calling me. The Lord's calling me. The Lord's calling me. And the one thing that never stuck with me in this until just recently in my life, and it's been the most convicting thing I have ever experienced as a parent. The Lord called Samuel. 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 Samuel immediately ran to Eli. You called me, Eli. No, I didn't call you. It wasn't me. Go lay down. No, no, no. You called me. How many of you know and understand that Samuel, having grown up in the temple, the one voice he would have recognized was Eli's? Right? I, I, me and my brothers joke about this often, that if my mom was sitting on this seat right here, and I was in the children's building, and my mom snapped her fingers, I would know it was my mom snapping her fingers. Can anybody relate to that? Yeah. You know their voice. You know them. Samuel knew Eli's voice, and here was the convicting part for me, because Eli was tasked with raising Samuel. And here's what Eli did in Samuel's life. When God called Samuel, Samuel couldn't tell the difference between God's voice and Eli's voice. Because if it would have been a different voice, he wouldn't have went to Eli. So let me ask you, church, do you sound so much like God that your kids don't know the difference? Do you sound so much like God that when you give counsel to your kids, it's as if it came from Scripture or God himself? See, Samuel was going, I don't know where else to go, but this voice sounds familiar. And he went to Eli. He went to his, his father figure, the temple priest. That's, where he, that's the only place he would have had to go. I, it's you It's calling me. He said, no, 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 it's not me, it's the Lord. I wonder, do your kids recognize what you say to them? 
Do they hold it in the same regard as if God spoke to them? Or are you trying to run two different things going, well, that's just not me. I'm not there yet. I don't have all the tools in place. I don't have it figured out yet. My temper gets a little sideways. Sometimes, no, 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 listen. You don't get that. That excuse will not work before God. Do you sound enough like God that your kids don't know the difference? I have not at times. I have not sounded like God. I don't mean that I was God. But if I am made in his image and likeness and according to this, we ought to even sound alike sometimes. There are definitely times that I have missed it as a parent. I've missed it as a husband. I've missed it as a pastor even. But my challenge to you is if you want to change your parenting, you want to change your family, if you want to head in the right direction, Ask God to teach you how to pray for your kids. How to teach them to find his way. And then to do everything he can to help you sound just like him.